Welcome to Guys Telling Stories. Bill, great to be back with you. How you doing? I'm excited to be back after our little break there. Mm, yeah, it was a good time. Good break. Good break. I've been raising a baby, home with him, and uh, your company, uh, Brew Bus Buffalo. I've, I've been, been, I've been raising a company. <laughs> it's uh, it's <laughs> now open for business, and from uh, from what I hear, it's thriving and and succeeding. Yeah, so congrats to you. Thank you, and congratulations to you and Court as well. Oh, yeah. Baby's doing great, and uh, I'm just happy to be back. We got our amazing guest today, Tim yes, Herzog. Yeah, he's uh, he's owner and founder of Flying Bison Brewing Company, a brewery distributing uh, beer for the past two and a half decades all over mm-hmm. Western New York. Yep. I yeah. love his beer. Yeah. What's the deal with them? You got a little connection, don't you? Well, uh, a few. There's a few connections. Kind of funny. You know, you grow up uh, high school, get a fake ID when you graduate and go to the local bar and he's bartending. So, uh, you know, <laughs> you go up to him, <laughs> professional bartender, professional mustache. Oh, yeah. And uh, you order a Labatt Blue at the time and uh, he looks at you and takes your ID, it says you're from Michigan, and he gives you a beer and says $2. It's great. Oh, that's great. Yeah. And then he opened a brewery. Um, my father helped helped him with some of that. And then uh, uh, that was his startup brewery. And then since has moved to uh, Larkinville area and has a, a very big, a very nice, brand new facility. It's not brand new anymore, but um, compared to the other one, uh, it's a beautiful building and a beautiful brewery. Yeah, so he is not some startup brewer. This isn't a new company that you know is just getting its uh, you know beak wet or feet wet. It is uh, someone that's been around. That's where Tim comes in. He's been around for for decades here. Mm-hmm. Like you said, everything from bartending to home brewing. And, uh, you know, from what I know, it started out as a grassroots operation, just an idea with some friends and family. Yeah, he was a home brewer first and uh, kind of... Went from there. Yeah, before home brewing and yeah. brew pubs and yes. breweries were even popular, he was uh, he was there doing it. And we're talking early '90s here, yep. but mm-hmm. flash forward 25 years, Tim invited us down to the brewery, like you said, located in downtown Larkinville, right in Buffalo. And mm-hmm. I'm hoping to hear all about how he got started in the beer business and take our time finding you know all the ups and downs and hearing all those stories. I, I he probably have stories for days. Yeah, know? I hope so. Yeah. Well, road trip, too. Yeah, road trip. You invited us oh, there. So uh, let's pack this stuff up and let's head to the brewery. Let's go. All right, Tim, welcome to the show. Well, thanks very much. It's great to be here. Well, to have you here in the brewery. That's right. Road trip. Uh, Bill, it's been a while since we've done one you know, on location, and this feels great. You're here all the time, though. Yeah, we're here pretty often. Yeah. Two days ago, even. Yeah, it's a beautiful, beautiful space. But Tim, for the people who are listening at home, where are we? What's the name of the company? And- this, this is Flying Bison Brewing Company. We're a small brewery, uh, but a distributing brewery in the city of Buffalo. And our beer is available pretty much just in western New York. Uh, we haven't saturated that market yet. Yeah, People here are thirsty. <laughs> well, um, we're, we're all over the internet. We have a website. We are on Facebook. We do Instagram. I shouldn't say we. It's really Vinny and Siobhan. Um, <laughs> thank you, Vinny. And, and I, just, Siobhan. I, I just have a beer. There you go. Well, speaking of beers, thank you very much. Yep. Che- cheers, gentlemen. Cheers, yeah. Yep. Uh, welcome. 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 I'm drinking the uh, Aviator Red. Bill, what do you got there? Spot Coffee Stout. How about you, Tim? Gulp. Um, well, I have two beers because I'm just that way. I have our uh, Buffalo Kolsch, uh, also called 716 Kolsch, and Aviator Red. And the reason I have both of these is because these are the first two beers that we introduced. The day that Flying Bison opened and started selling beer and distributing it into the market was May 1st, 2000, and we had two beers to offer the general public. And Kolsch is a light-bodied, crisp, dry, yellow German beer style, and then Aviator Red is a nice ruby red, Irish red ale, a little kiss of malt up front, a nice clean finish. It's a good drinking beer. Have they changed yeah. much over the years? Or are they that you know that's always a loaded question because um, that's one of the most asked questions I get. But the the answer is no, but at the same time yes because beer is made with stuff that grows from the ground. Mm-hmm. It's a little different every year, so you're constantly adjusting and tweaking little bits and pieces on your recipe, certain certain malts get a little drier, they decide to roast them a, a, a little hotter, or a certain variety of hop gets a little less spicy, or so on and so on. There's, there's a number of biological changes that happen to plants and through the process. The brewer's job is to try and make it taste as consistent as possible. Okay. So we're constantly tweaking what we're doing 
to try and keep it tasting the same. And then my job is to make sure that you don't notice that We've been tap dancing like crazy for 18 years. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, if we could go back maybe uh, well before those 18 years, a good friend of ours, we were here uh, watching the Bills playoff game, and uh, he asked me to, uh, to remind you about the rugby days, the uh, Buffalo Rugby Club, and to how, take us back to those days. It's well known you're a home brewer, and uh, <laughs> you know what were those days like for you? Yeah, I don't need to be reminded. When I look in the mirror and I look at my crooked nose, <laughs> I get reminded my one shoulder hangs a lot lower than the other one. Shirts don't fit me all that well. <laughs> Souvenirs from the rugby days, absolutely. Um, and actually, the I was showing you a picture that's circa 1979. Uh, hence, a lot of you know giant curly hair and some really bad porn mustaches and stuff. <laughs> I can see it from here, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So that's, uh, I would say if you went up and down, I can name more than half of those guys. And I've probably seen a quarter to a third of them within the last six months. That's great. That's awesome, yeah. So, yeah, it's nice to, I mean, a lot of it's because they come in and they drink beer. <laughs> you know, old yeah. habits die hard. What but, can I know, say? 30 whatever years later, yeah. they're, still, uh, they're still around. Mm -hmm. You know, taking us back to those days, were you the guy uh, buying beer, brewing beer? I know you're no, known as a home it, brewer. It wasn't, no, that wasn't allowed back then. Okay. So shortly after that is where it all started. Um, but the beer that was available back then was just not much flavor to it. You know, it was a lot of major national brand stuff and names that people wouldn't so much recognize anymore. Schlitz and Schmitz and mm -hmm. Strohs and, you know, a lot of those kind of regionals have died off. But they're all kind of Budweiser, Labatt's, Molson kind of styles that really super light, you know, almost club soda color. You know, sure. very, it was kind of a race to the bottom of flavor. People, they were just emphasizing lighter, lighter. Mm -hmm. It's lighter tasting. It's lighter body. It's slower. It's lighter. So I, I just never liked that. Somewhere uh, along in 1976, now try and imagine this one. Um, when I was a high school senior, I could legally drink beer before I graduated high school. Yeah, that's a that's a day long gone now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's how you can tell how old I am because <laughs> I talk in terms like that. But... Um, I also had a part-time job working at a grocery store, and I saw this four-pack of little bottles of beer from Ireland, and I had no idea what it was, but it was Guinness Foreign Export Stout. And I bought the four-pack because it was legal. I could do it. And, you know, walked home from my job and, you know, opened a bottle of it. And, hey, Mom, because my mom was Irish, my dad was German. And in Rochester back then, I didn't know what that meant. Um, it was really more about did your dad work at Kodak or did your dad work at Xerox or, mm -hmm. you know, so on and so on. So there wasn't, you know, there's no great potato pancake recipe or sour broughten recipe or you know anything like that left over, but some other good stories. Uh, but I, you know, poured the beer. Mom said it looked like motor oil. She wasn't going to touch it. And I said, wow, it was so different from anything else that I'd had. And then from that point on, I became a professional beer complainer. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Nothing's like, nothing good's available, right. in your opinion. Well, you go into another store. Oh, well, how come that store had this beer from Ireland and your store doesn't have that beer? And it, you know, that tasted like good stuff and all this other stuff doesn't have any flavor whatsoever. So when um, Betsy and I got married for my birthday that year, she gave me a homebrew startup kit as a gag gift. You know, you think you can do better, haha, because we both like to cook. Yeah. Um, I probably did more cooking back then than she did, but we both like to cook a lot and bake and like to mess around in the kitchen and stuff. Um, so she gave me this as a gag gift. And if you look over my shoulder back into the brewery, that's where all that kind of came from. And she doesn't really find it all that funny anymore. <laughs> <So> <laughs> we've hocked the house several times over and... Um, you know, here, here we are. So yeah. 37 years of brewing. So 1981 is when I started. Um, been brewing beer for 37 years. And Flying Bison's been open for 18. So. Well, what was that decade like after college when you, know, you, it sounded like you were meeting your wife, you're starting your family, but were you working odd jobs? Were you off studying yeah. how to make beer? What, you know? um, mostly odd jobs because by education, I'm an art teacher and graphic designer. And nice. that meant that it was a lot of freelance and a lot of substitute teaching. They were cutting art teachers like crazy in 1980. And uh, the big ad agencies in town were all starting to condense. Computers were starting to come on the scene for doing 
skills that I had learned as a graphic designer, like page layout and typesetting and things like that, where you know, it was done by hand, now it's going to be done by a computer. Mm -hmm. And that was coming in really, really fast. So there just wasn't a lot of work to be had. And there's five schools within the sound of our voice right now that produce graphic designers and still do. Um, and there's some career, some not career. You know, a lot of them go into web design, uh, internet design, uh, things like that, uh, little videos. Um, back then, you know, either you could draw or you couldn't. So, so that kind of went away. Um, so I was, my wife was an engineer. She worked for National Fuel, the gas company here in town. Yeah. And so she had the job with the benefits and the pay and the retirement and the vacation. And I was just working for hourly wage. Yeah. So I got into working bars, restaurants, uh, and that's actually where I met Bill. I was working in a place called Lochran's on, on mm -hmm. Main Street in Snyder. Uh, and, you know, to even tighten it up a little more, his dad is the architect that helped us open the, the brewery when we were over in Riverside. He did all our architectural and engineering work for us. Now, Bill, I didn't know that. Did you know that? I did. Know, yeah. Oh, yeah, I did, I did know that. <laughs> that is really cool. Yeah, it's one of the first people to see the inside of the brewery. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure we'll get to some of those brewery stories now, but, uh, you know, what, what do you got over there, Bill? I see you. Well, my notes here? Well, I'm, I'm just looking where, where you actually studied the beer. Um, so going along, home brewing, getting really crazy about it, and there just was no outlet for it. You know, there was no brewery. There was no such thing as a career at that time. But this, this entity came along that we now know as the Brewers Association, and it's a national um, association, and it's all about education, and they've got a marketing arm now and a legislative arm. And it went from a couple of guys in the back room of a store in Boulder, Colorado, to a major force to be reckoned with. I mean, we lobby on Capitol Hill. Yeah. I've gone to the United States Senate and stood in that room and lobbied before Senate, lobbied before Congress for tax relief, for, uh, you know, give small businesses a break, yeah. um, you know, things of that nature that... You know, without being in the brewing industry, I would have never had an opportunity to do anything like that. And now, when we were on the way here, Bill got a phone call for an intern we had a few years back. Funny enough, he helped us at a recording when we were down in Southern Tier mm -hmm. at that brewing company. And uh, I know you didn't start you know, just out of the blue, for example. Did you have some internships or did you go to some brewing institute somewhere? Yeah. You know, were you traveling all over the country, you know, learning the craft? Or Yes, a certain amount. So a lot of home brewing experience. Mm -hmm. My my homebrewing setup went from being a five-gallon white plastic bucket to a one-barrel professional-grade pilot system. Okay. We still have it. We still use it. Nice. Um, so it got real crazy at my house. Um, <laughs> and I went to Brewers Association, joined that. It was the American Home Brewers Association first, and then they, they started the, uh, what was it called in the meantime, the, the Brewers Association of the Americas, something like that. Yeah, the America Brewing Guild or and, Brewers Guild? Or and well, like then there's the American Brewers okay. Guild. That was another group. Uh, that was more of an educational thing. Yeah. And they kind of worked out of the University of California at Davis, and that's become a, an accredited course at the, the university now. Uh, the American Brewers Guild, the, the name might still be around, but the, yeah. the idea of it's kind of washed out. Okay. But the, so everything else kind of slammed together under Brewers Association. So they have a conference every year. And so m the closest thing I had to a vacation for a lot of years was going to the BA conference and taking courses from the Siebel Institute mm -hmm. from Chicago. Three days, you basically get <laughs> locked into the hotel ballroom for three days. And, you know, the course this year is on filtration. Of course, the next year would be on yeast handling, um, different facets of the brewing industry. So I have probably six master's level courses on different facets of brewing, uh, tons of experience, decades of experience. Um, and, and back in the olden days, the, you had to get books and magazines. You couldn't look <laughs> stuff up on the Internet. You had to order the book by mail and it would come by mail and then you had to read it so i've got crates and crates and crates of books and technical papers and magazines and journals and you know anything i could get my hands on i just get it and tear through it and then i'd be brewing beer while i'm reading while about reading. you know the next piece coming along so mm -hmm. i i would be 
brewing during the day, and then I would work at night while my wife and kids were sleeping, and then I'd come home and get about an hour, and then I'd be back up and doing it again. So the joke gift that started it all uh, stayed in the home for a long time. Mm-hmm. Uh, the support system there, were they, were they excited that you were doing it? Were they... Uh, when's he gonna stop doing this, uh, <laughs> Dad? It's the '90s now. Come on. There, there was a from Betsy. There's a certain amount of you know, just kind of. She's always been very loving and caring and supporting, but you can you could almost hear her roll her eyes sometimes. You know, it's just like, oh my God, not again. You know, another sack of grain. But she was really cool about it because the neighbors all liked the beer. Her family are pretty big beer drinkers, so they all thought it was really cool. Um, her dad came and helped hang drywall and paint when we started. Her brother-in-law came and helped, you know, when they had days off and time off. So, you know, the support system was really there. The kids, when they were little, I've got pictures of them, like, like taking little pinches of grain out of the, out of the little hand crank mill. You know, the, oh, Dad's not looking. I'm going to steal some of this. And, they, you know, it was kind of a game. They thought it was funny. I brought someone here that did that. <laughs> yeah, there's always some little kids running around here. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Uh, I've got a picture of Colin, who you see him through the window there, the tall guy, one of the brewers here, standing next to a carboy, and he's probably four, maybe five years old, and looking at the, the fermentation and, and just the chunks of yeast flying around, and it looks like a blizzard in there. And he has this look of delight on his face that this is the coolest thing it's like watching cartoons mm-hmm. it's really funny well he's a brewer didn't th- there was no straight line there, right you know all the way around the outside um, he started here because he started helping me out one of my guys got hired away by genesee brewing company and colin was just graduating from fredonia and i said hey can you come and help me out for a couple of weeks you know how to wash kegs and clean a tank and i really need a pair of hands for a little while Sure. So when you know he needed some money, he was just he needed beer money. He just getting out of college, so he uh, uh, he came and worked at the brewery for a bit. And uh, when I said, "Okay, we're I think we're stabilized here, and we'll, I'm ready to start looking," you know, I hope you've been sending resumes out. And he says, "Well, I want to talk to you about that." <laughs> I'd like think, to stay on, huh? I think I'm staying. So he's been here ten years. Ryan's been here ten. Paul's been here ten. Paul Jackson, who's not here, he gets here at five in the morning. He is uh, one of the original investors in Flying Bison Brewing Company. So he retired from his job so that he could work here to work his last five years at a brewery before he retired for real. Oh, that's cool. So I like that. Life, I like that life goals. Of, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, if you love brewing and it's in your blood, it sounds like it is for him and for the rest right. of your family. Why not get up at five in the morning? Right. Go do what you love. Right. And then maybe come here on a Saturday and, and then, see a bunch of your buddies come right. up. Well, then he goes home and he home brews. Oh, so, yeah. He's, Paul is one of the most award-winning home brewers I've ever met in my life. He stopped entering his beer in home brewing competitions because he just, he had enough awards. Just let somebody mm-hmm. else get some awards. Yeah. I've, just, I've done enough. He won the Lifetime Achievement Award. <laughs> yes. That's a nice way of saying stop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cut it out. Cut it out. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if I'm moving along this timeline, I'm, I'm seeing how supportive family's been. But I know I've heard quite a few stories, and you told me once, about uh, a man uh, with the nickname Red and the beer yeah. sitting in front of me. So, uh, you know, where did you meet Red? Well, um... So one of those bartending jobs I had was I was working other you know, part-time evening jobs in retail and such, just trying to put some money in the family bank account. And I was out at um, Eastern Hills Mall working at a store out there. And on the way home, I would drive by the building that's now the Buffalo Brew Pub. And once they put those fermenters in the window, I said, I know what those are. Yeah. <laughs> There's only one thing those can be. And I just, you know, put my ear to the ground and I started listening and talking and, well, what is this? Who knows? Does anybody know what's going on here? Finally just went and knocked on the door and I said, I'm, you know, I'm a home brewer and an experienced bartender and I've worked here, here, and here. And uh, if this is going to be a brew pub, I'd love to work here. And they, you know, tried it. Well, um, the guy that was the, the manager, and his, his name was Phil Donahue, which is kind of funny, because <laughs> yeah. Phil Donahue was on TV at the yes. time, and I, I just must have had a look on my face like, 
really? Because he goes, yes, my name is really Phil Donahue. <laughs> right. <laughs> but Michael he Bolden. was trying, well, what makes you, what <laughs> yeah. makes you think that, that this is going to be a, a brew pub, you said? I said, well, those fermenters in the window, um, you know, it looks like you've got a single stage kettle and, and three fermenters and probably a conditioning tank, if I, if I had to guess, unless you've got a big basement downstairs. He goes, maybe you should fill out an application. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I started there Halloween night, 1980. Six, and I worked there for seven years, um, okay. and brewed and managed and so on and so forth. So this big biker-looking guy came walking in one night with this enormous Viking beard. Before they were cool and awesome, dude. Right. Um, just just flaming red beard down to the middle of his chest, and he came in and his. When he would shake my hand, it would go missing up to my wrist. And you're not a just, small guy, like you, no, you know. Red, Red was a big boy, wow. big barrel-chested guy. His thumbs were as big as my wrists. You know, <laughs> he just—he was just a big boy. So, but he came up, and I like, oh my god, this guy could kill me. And he was like, hey, I wanted to meet you. I want to talk to you. I'm like, did I hit your car in the grocery exactly. store parking yeah. lot, or <laughs> you know, I'll just hide under here. <laughs> Uh, but he goes, hey, I, I understand you make beer, and I do some beer making, and uh, I'm here to meet a guy who I had already met. His name was uh, Chris Dates, and Chris was also a home brewer and had been buying some home brewing supplies in bigger quantities. And there was very little selection in your materials back then. There was one or two types of malt extract, and there's cans, or you could get a bag of dry, and that was kind of it. Now... Homebrewers can get anything we can get here at Flying Bison, a homebrewer can get at their local homebrew supply right. shop. So it's changed an incredible amount over, over years. So Red says, I'm meeting this guy, and I'm thinking about you know, doing a homebrewer's co-op with stuff. Would you be interested? And yeah, absolutely. I, I need stuff. Yeah. I need to buy stuff to make mm-hmm. beer. So we became friends in a couple of seconds, but he was that kind of guy. So he and I eventually went to England. We became very fast friends, did some brewing together. He started a homebrew supply shop in his basement, and it became a pretty expansive shop. Um, and, you know, we just, he was my kid's extra uncle. You know, he just was, but he was, he was the uncle that, uh, you didn't want him to teach the kids everything that he taught the kids. <laughs> so one, one day we were over at his house getting some stuff. We're in the backyard, and you can hear the squirrels chirping in the trees, just you know, being obnoxious. And he goes, I hate those things. So he goes to the house and gets a paintball gun, and he, he you know, hit one of them. And my younger son, Peter, who has a real job, he works for a construction supply company, he... Uh, he said, wow, that was really cool. And he goes, here, you try it. <laughs> Puts the gun right in his hands. Yeah. yeah. I, Teaches um, him how to aim it. Red, he's nine. <laughs> you might want to think about that. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. When uh, the cottonwood would fall real dense along the side of the driveway, he would come out with a uh, butane lighter and light it, and it would just burn down the driveway, and it would make a <laughs> zoop, a sound like that. So, like, um... You might not want to teach kids how to set stuff on fire, fire. Yeah. you know, but he was, he was just a, a big, giant, playful kid. He and I had more fun together than humans should be allowed. Um, we went to England, so my first trip overseas was with Red. We went to Mutton's Maltings. We went to brew pubs. We talked to hop brokers. And he would meet people in pubs. He had been to England a couple times before. Well, we got to be at the, at the Blue Post at, at 5 o'clock on Friday. I don't know. All right, I don't care about why. He goes, well, you know, these two guys, Sid and Joe, uh, that I met last time I was here, I sent them a postcard. This is before the internet. Right, right. Yeah, so this is 1990, 91. Uh, you know, we're going to meet there and have a couple of beers. Learned about their local and their beer and where they work. It was, it was cultural exchange you know, over, of course, a beer. So that's, that's red. And then he, so we became on the, on the, uh, the flight home, he said, I've heard that you're thinking about doing a brew pub. Would you talk to me about it? You know, would you like a partner? I said, if the partner's you, then yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. So that's, that's where it started. That's where it started. Well, we'll be back to hear how and why you started that company right after this. 
Well, hey, Bill, the good folks at Brew Bus Buffalo are uh, proud to sponsor the podcast this season. That's and, great. Uh, from what I know, and I'll ask you in a second, it's an all-inclusive VIP beer tasting experience located right here in western new york so bill let me turn it over to you what makes brew bus buffalo a unique experience well rich it's the vip treatment that you get and it comes from having a professional driver and also a professional tour guide on the bus it is an all-inclusive tour includes your special experiences which could be a question and answer with a brewer or brewery owner could be drinking straight from the holding tank i've seen those uh pictures Uh, could be a brewery tour, depending on, on where we go that day. Uh, all the tastings are included, and the tour guide goes up and gets them for you, and, and, and you're already in your seat, so you don't have to wait in line. You don't have to pull money out. Everything is taken care of at the brewery for you. Oh, I love being treated like uh, royalty. So No waiting in lines is big, especially these breweries are busy now, so when they know we're coming, they hold a nice little private area for us, and, and, and we run the beer for you. That sounds good. What can you do for our listeners if they're interested, in, if they're visiting Niagara Falls, or if they're coming into town what, what can we do for them sure we go to our website brewbusbuffalo.com and when you book a tour we'll give you five dollars off your tour you have to uh, book it at our website and use the promo code beer five no spaces beer five and you get five dollars off your tour booked at brewbusbuffalo.com oh that sounds great and now back to our interview with tim so tim you have a partner now you're ready to open a brewery or brew pub Explain the process, because that, that everyone now seems it's a lot easier now, today, yeah. than it was probably when you did it. So explain what you had to do to get that going. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, this, this story, people seem to love this story. So you have to apply for a federal license first and get approved, and then you have to take that approval and apply for a state license. Now, back then, n- very few people knew what the hell we were talking about. Mm-hmm. So the old uh, Delsky Federal Office Building, which is now a hotel, um, was on Huron between Elmwood and Delaware. So I walked in there, and that's the first time I ever went through the screening that we all now do routinely at airports and Mm -hmm. libraries and every place else. I had a pocket knife. I always have a pocket knife. So I had to take the knife out, go set it on the steps, go back in, went upstairs. Back then it was called... uh, um, ATF, the Bureau of Alcohol, and Tobacco, and Firearms. And there's this big strapping fellow who looks like he works out professionally with the T-shirt on that really looked like it was spray-painted on him. He's got a hog-leg pistol that goes from his rib cage down to about his knee, this big, giant pistol. And he's an ATF agent. And so I told him what I wanted to do, and he goes, really? Huh. And he goes in you know, the back room, and there's just, you can see row and row and row of like library shelving. And he'd you know, go away, and he'd, he'd get yellow pieces of paper. He'd come back, and he's got, and this, this, every time I see him walk by, it's, the stack's getting thicker and thicker <laughs> and thicker. And he come, and by the way, I had to leave my, my pen knife outside right. <laughs> so that I wouldn't hurt this guy who has like a 38 caliber magnum strapped <laughs> to his hip. But, you know, he's safe from me. Yeah. Um, so he sets this pile of paperwork down in front of me. It's about as thick as a phone book. And he goes, you know, this is a lot more paperwork than it would take to open a machine gun factory. Really? I said, well, <laughs> what would I need for that? And he goes, a zoning permit and a gun license. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this, this folder, that's all you need. And like, I got a phone book just so I could make beer. So that was, you know, I, sh- I should have known then that we were going to be in for a bit of a journey. So it took us time to, you know, friends put in their poker money, their vacation money. Um, You know, when you hear people opening breweries now, they're being backed by real estate brokers and investors and, you know, people with money from other sources. These were my friends and neighbors that put their money in to get this thing off the ground. So when you talk about grassroots, I mean, this, this was from below the grass. Yeah, you basically did crowdfunding before crowdfunding was crowdfunding. Yeah. You know, it's uh, friends yeah. and family crowdfunding. And uh, it, how, how long would you say well, the red tape lasted for before you actually you know, well, we decided We incorporated on in 95, and uh, unfortunately, Red was killed in a motorcycle accident in 97. We had our provisional federal license by them, so we were two years and change into the process. Um, and we had 
some of the backers money we were going to need to get more but we thought we had enough to start applying for bank financing so went and applied for bank financing um, met a guy who was very helpful and you know got us moving down the track red has his accident we have to go back and take everything apart because anything that had to do with his estate it all had to come apart. So we had to unfinance, we had to unlicense, we had to un everything. And then took some time, and this is where you know, Betsy and I went away for a weekend, and she had a, a work, well, it wasn't so much a weekend, but she had a work conference for three days down in Skinny Atlas. She said, You're coming with me. You know, you got to get out of town for a little while. So we were down there, brought a book to read. <laughs> the hotel we stayed in had Schneider Weiss in bottles excellent German wheat beer and a big front porch that overlooked the lake. So second night, went for dinner with some of her friends from work and she says, you know, we're gonna, you and I are going for a walk. So we get back, go for a walk and she goes, all right, so what are you gonna do? I said, I don't know, I don't know. It seems almost sacrilegious to keep going. And she goes, all right, let's, let's go the other way. What the hell would you do with yourself if you didn't do this? <laughs> I said, all right, I guess I'll start the paperwork on Monday. And you just had to go back in and just face that big burly guy. <laughs> I'm, I'm, had to, I had to put his memory on my shoulder and carry it with me, mm -hmm. which is great. Um, it's the friendship we had, the time we spent together. Um, I wouldn't trade it for the world. I wouldn't wish anybody to lose a friend like that. Um, but there's, there's a picture of him on the wall yep. over there, the guy in the green T-shirt. Um, and we've got lots of other pictures of just fun stuff we did together. Breweries we visited, um, places we went. So. Yeah, I, I, we always ask about the struggles that you have to overcome. And, you know, red tape or um, I'm, I'll ask you in a moment about a broken toe story I heard or the kids having to paint the wall. But Oh, broken. I, I got, I got, my younger son introduces me as, this is my dad. He's broken every bone in his body. Yeah. So while that's not completely true. It's not all that far from wrong. Right. But moving along, the struggles don't end, and, and the successes in, in, in the story, it, it's even get to the point to where we're sitting here. We're not even close to that. So, so let me ask you, you, you decide to redo the paperwork, and uh, you got some funding from family and friends, but how do you decide on a place to actually locate you know, the first, the first well, incarnation of the brewery? Um, price and uh, price. Price and price. So, there, you know, we only had a very little bit of money, and we found, and this is another Lochran's connection. There was a guy who would come in once in a while, and I think he sold medical supplies. And uh, his ex-wife's brother had bought a building over in Riverside, and it was an old grocery store plaza. And he said, he's storing cars and boats and stuff. It's got to be big enough for what you're talking about. So he made an appointment, and I went and looked at it, and the Lochran's guy wound up getting transferred, moves to Texas. I haven't seen him since. We wound up renting 7,000 square feet for an embarrassingly small amount of money, but for the guy who owned the building, this would help him pay off what he bought the building for in two years. Wow, okay. So he bought the building on a credit card at a city auction. It was an abandoned building. So. Um, it's now owned by Deval Safety. So we were there for 14 years. We were there for about 12 and a half years under that owner. And then um, when Deval bought it, I went to him and said, well, we'd like about another 3,000 square feet. And they said, well, actually, we'd like about another 7,000 square feet. <laughs> Which is, the, the, you got to hey, kick rocks. It's time to go. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. And then they were extremely nice about it. Right. While... Um, we you know, packed up, found a place, and got out. In the meantime, the world financial market crashes, and we were part of that. Um, we were not real well financed to begin with. We were uh, carrying the weight of the industry around Buffalo. There was not a whole lot of other people getting in going, hey, beer, hey, beer. And I was the only maniac out in the street doing that at the time. The other places that were here, Pearl Street, Buffalo Brew Pub, were restaurants that made beer and kept the beer on their premises so they could you know, do their hand-to-hand -hand marketing over the bar. Right. That wasn't allowed back then, and Red and I had decided to not do a brew pub 
because the 4 a.m. closing time, having to have a kitchen, having to have a chef, a menu, all that extra stuff, it would take away from the time and energy to make beer. So we thought the world was ripe, well, the world, you know, Buffalo, Western New York, was ripe for a distributing brewery. Um, Buffalo Brewing Company had come and gone, um, but we thought, you know, like any entrepreneur, we thought we had the right concept in the right place at the right time. So that's why we pushed on. So we kept going through that. Uh, got open, banged our heads against the wall for a long time, um, just living hand to mouth. Uh, didn't get paid for the first six years. Finally got up off the ground. We were making some money. We were starting to move along, and the price of malt almost doubles. The price of hops more than quadruples. And um, the distributor's not going to pay more for it. You know, this is just this is what you got to live with. Now, what do you do? So I, uh, a brewery from the Northeast came in and made a pass at us, but it was very scorched earth offer. Uh, we'll, you know, keep you on as a salesman for a little while, and maybe one or two of the beers. You know, we'll sell the equipment, keep that money, and you know that sort of stuff. Like, how does this help anybody but you guys? Right. You know, and they said, well, it really doesn't. So, I, well, then why should I do that? So I got in touch with um, Nick Matt, who I knew from lobbying efforts with New York State and the federal government, and I knew he would be honest with me. And I, you know, Nick, can I talk to you for a little bit? And he goes, you know what, I'm, I'm on a call, but I do want to talk to you. Let me call you back. He called me back, and he said, why don't you come down Friday, let's, let's talk. He goes, you guys are struggling. Well, you know, I had a little bit of pride left, not much, but a little. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, what makes you think we're struggling? He goes, because anybody who's brewing less than 10,000 barrels a year right now is struggling like crazy. So we want to talk to you as much as you want to talk to us. So I went down that Friday, and, and basically we did it on a cocktail napkin in their office. Uh, came up with an agreement that we're seven years into it um, and still runs pretty darn well. Here we are. You know, we've expanded. We've grown. We're still expanding. We're still growing. Um, you know, Not lightning bolt, but just nice, slow, steady growth that's sustainable. So to elaborate a little bit on that, if I can, um, basically the cost of the products for a small business is a lot more than the cost of the products for a bigger business when right. it comes to buying bulk materials. Right. If, so I might spend I don't know, 70 cents a pound for a pound of malt and somebody the size of Sierra Nevada or Sam Adams or New Belgium probably spends 40 cents a pound for that same malt. Exact same stuff from the exact same broker at the exact same time. Just they're going to buy several train car loads of it right now and then more in the future. Train car load would probably do me for the year. Yeah, okay. You know, you mentioned before um, when you're going through some tougher times, Betsy pulling you aside saying, you know, what are you going to do? Yeah. Um, what was her take and, you know, what type of support did she show you during, during this transitional time? Oh, she was great with everything. I mean, we hawked our futures um, to keep Flying Bison Brewing Company going. Um, we mortgaged the house three times. We, you know, when our friends wanted to talk to us about it, we, you know, this is where we are. We, you know, we could close next Friday. We need a couple more grand to keep right. going. And well, right. me and my friends have some poker money, and we'll split a share. And we'll, you know, so there were those kinds of conversations that were uh, ridiculously uncomfortable. Sure. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, it's the Mark Twain definition of uh, of wealth. It's the quality and number of your friends. Yeah. I'm the richest man you've ever met in your life. <laughs> Quality <laughs> friends and a whole lot of them. Yeah. I like that. You know, Bill, you and I, we've been experiencing, you know, this revival of the you know, craft beer and beer scene here in Buffalo, not only maybe the past 10 years, but, you know, going on maybe 15 now. Mm-hmm. We've talked about, you know, the, our favorite beers in the past episodes. Oh, yeah. Uh, but what do you remember, you know, from, uh, just, I guess, just from growing up? Because oh, I never, I, I didn't know that you're... Your dad drew up the architectural plans. I'm surprised that never that never came it never up. came up. So well, Bill Bill's dad was a bass ale drinker at the, Lochran's. There you was. go. Okay. So he was drinking what was really good beer back then. Mm-hmm. There, it was available. There was a place to do it. 
Um, evening stroll. I hope, hope I'm not telling too much. No, 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 no. He's, he, he wears it proudly. Yeah, yeah. but uh, John, John would take an evening stroll after dinner and come down and have a beer and just chat sports politics whatever mm-hmm. he's a he's a smart guy he uh is a very personal guy and he he wants to know what you're thinking mm-hmm. um so we had lots of great conversations uh with a stretch of pine in between us he's and, a good listener he he yeah. absorbs it he remembers well he was he was great with um with the brewery because one the, the great thing about working with with bill's dad was that i was dealing with Alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, and New York State Liquor Authority, and the City of Buffalo, and 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 the the departments of, of permitting and all that stuff, and just they had no idea what the hell I was talking about. And you would tell, I need a six foot length of pipe that's six inches in diameter. You know, I mean, you can't make that make sense to some of these people. Right. And John would just sit there and process it and go, okay. And he make a quick quick sketch and go, you know, something like this. I go, yeah, but it needs to bend over here. Okay, yeah, you do that. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, so there were those conversations and we were working with a big box and all we were doing is taking a big box and separating it off from a bigger box to city code. And that's where he was hugely helpful. And he introduced me to the concept of every government entity that you deal with will work in direct opposition with every other government entity you deal with. (laughs) So our state liquor authority says all the doors have to lock. Americans with Disabilities Act, or I'm sorry, a fire code says, no, they got it. You got to be able to get out. (laughs) Americans with Disabilities Act says you got to have a ramp before you have anything else. The first thing we did to build a brewery was to build an 18 foot long wheelchair ramp to get into the brewery that we used one time in 14 years. <laughs> was it for someone in a wheelchair? Yes. Was it? Okay. So I guess someone just bought way too much. <laughs> That's a skiing accident. Oh, oh. In a cast up above his knee. Well, to answer answer your question from before. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Th- there was a New Year's, uh, New Year's Eve, and New Year's, uh, and we and Don are out, and maybe a couple friends, and I think we're at Snyder Bar and gr- or first place at the time. And we used to make New Year's resolutions like everyone else does. And we can never keep them. So it's like, let's start making New Year's resolutions that we can keep and just simplify it. At the time, we were drinking Labatt Blue. And our New Year's resolution was to drink Blue Light. And <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Unexpected. Healthier, you okay. know, a little less alcohol. Like, let's try little steps. Um, the reason I tell that story is also in that same bar was when I had, you know, I'm, I'm not sure now if it's Aviator Red or Rusty Chain or whatever. Uh, Glenn had Back on then, tap there. That would have been Aviator Red. Okay. So, Rusty Chain's not that old in our portfolio. So it was Aviator Red. Yeah. Um, and that was the uh, gateway beer for me to drinking other things. Because up until that time, it was blue, 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 blue. We don't have blue. I oh, have a blue light. <laughs> Yep, and then, and then that was so like. So then after that New Year's resolution, it switched. It's blue switched. light, blue light, blue light. Well, yeah. we don't have that. All right, I'll have a blue. <laughs> All right, but then you, you know, then, torturing me. Then you open yourself up a little bit, and and uh, obviously I I knew you already at that point. Um, and it's just maybe it was just someone buys you one huh? and you drink it. It, it uh, who knows how you get there, but that's just that's what started it. And they also had Guinness on tap, so then you go, I'll yeah. try that. Yeah. Do you have any butterscotch schnapps I can put in it? Just give it. <laughs> okay. Uh, but eventually, it opens up your taste and everything else. So the New Year's resolution, is, as weird as it was, trying to switch, you changed a five, six, seven, ten-year pattern, uh, and then it you, you can open yourself up to other things. So that's kind of my history with that. And yeah. the iceberg crashes around you. Right. Yeah. Well, we're sitting here in this, you know, I would say newer facility, but it's it's a few years old now. Yeah, um, we're coming up on four years old. Yeah. So, what can you tell people about uh, future plans? You know, things that you're you know currently excited about, or even in the distant future, five years, ten years. I'm excited about being able to just sit down here and have a beer with you guys because oh. this doesn't happen very often. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I can imagine. So, yeah. So that's really great. Um, future plans. That's that's a really challenging question right now um, because the world is changing around us at a rate that is kind of hard for 
people, I don't, I don't know, not so much people my age, but breweries and Sierra Nevada is going through it and, and New Belgium is going through it and anybody that's been open more than four or five years is going through this that it used to be when you opened a brewery to be a distributing brewery that the, the game was you would make as much beer as you could of a very high quality and get it out at a fair price and get it into the market and try and market it to bars and restaurants and stores and get it sold and spread the worth, the right. wealth. Spread the word. And uh, now nobody is going to drink your beer until they have come to your brewery and played a game of giant Jenga or thrown a game of cornhole. Isn't that funny? Or yeah. come on a bus tour <laughs> and had a flight or you know, had your giant spent grain pretzel with a glass of beer. They just won't pick up that six pack until they've had that experience. Mm -hmm. And so now you've got to have a sampling room. It doesn't matter whether you want one or not, you've got to have it. And it's not a bar, it's not a restaurant, and we really try hard to not be that. And a lot of the other breweries have just gone there with full-on restaurants mm -hmm. and bars and banquet rooms and all kinds of other stuff. And it's still just trying to be true to our roots. In the end, it's about you know going to Lockards and having that pint with your friends, mm -hmm. going to Wegmans and getting a couple six packs and going to consumers and, and you know maybe get a case and have your friends over for a cookout or you know to, to just just keep that kind of positive experience of having the beer and enjoying it with friends and family going where if you pack everybody in here, there's only so many people that fit in this room. True. But if you can get them to come in and try it, now they all go out and share it with three other people. Well, mm -hmm. now you've got an unpaid sales staff of 200 people. Cool. So it's just trying to keep the, the idea behind the sampling room for us is to keep it a positive experience, smiling, friendly people behind the counter. Um, I want a taste of this. Here you go. Try a taste of this. And a lot of times when they come in, it's, it's asking them, what do you like or what do you not like? So let's try and box out, you know, so it's not, well, you have to drink our IPAs because IPAs are awesome. That may be true for me or for you mm -hmm. or for somebody else, but it's not true for everybody. Fruit beers might be awesome for some people, not for some other people. So it's, it's nice to have the opportunity to, to put a beer in front of them and have them go, wow, I never thought I'd like this, but I do. Okay, there's a new opportunity. Mm -hmm. Awesome, Bill. Where, where do you see uh, you and the brewery industry in five years? Because you just started a new business that is incorporating both. Well, everything that Tim just said is part of the reason we started it. Mm -hmm. And there's there's a point in time where uh, new breweries were opening at such a pace that there's only so long they can all survive, and they're all going to have to change, uh, or they're going to need to grow. And the only way you grow is by exposing new people to their products. Um, and with the brew bus, it's exactly what he just said. Mm -hmm. I'm not, we're not here to get people drunk. We're here to give people a good experience to get them. It's called a tasting tour because we want people to taste things. You're not required to drink it. You don't have to put a pint in front of you and you have to drink it. If you don't like something, I'll try to get you something else. You don't have to drink it, but mm -hmm. please taste it and try something new and have a good experience and then rate us and then talk about it and take pictures and put it on your social media and it's all of that stuff that um, with the brew bus with a tour guide with the everyone there can has the time and that responsibility to do when we go to some of these breweries and they obviously are overwhelmed with the number of people that are there that day um, we take some of the onus off of them to do that by helping with the social media in a way that everyone has a good time. Yeah, so. the, the nice thing about Bill's bus and the way that he does his tours is if five minutes before he walked in the door, everybody here came down with the flu, Bill could still cover. He knows enough about each of the breweries, not just Flying Bison, but he knows enough about each of the breweries and enough about their basic beer portfolio that he can guide a tasting in a way that gets people to understand, well, I, I thought I didn't like IPAs, but it's, it's really stouts I don't like, or you know, some, something. He helps you, f 
He's he's a beer shepherd. <laughs> he guides you through the wilderness to the safety of of the farm. So. <laughs> but yeah. but that's what's nice Bless about you, when, when he comes <laughs> yeah. yes, with his rod and his staff. This is, yeah. not, this um, is not paid advertising, by the way. No. This kind of just happened. No, but I the, appreciate the, it. His his tours are fun, and uh, I've had an opportunity to ride the bus, and it's really cool. He's got a nice audiovisual presentation. Um, so we'll continue to have fun with the brew bus. Yeah, Happy well, to hear. I'm excited about both your answers because it's interesting to take something like that you loved, you know, growing up and you, you know, worked like intertwined with your family and friends and, you know, grew into a successful business and Bill, same thing with you. But now it's more of like a, um, an interpersonal business. Like uh, your business will be successful based on the number of people who can, come and bring their love of craft beer tourism seeing a new city and not only see one place but see 10 places right. mm-hmm. and um it seems like that's where where the business is headed so it'll be interesting to see how everything from social media to maybe some cool apps you know play into that and uh i guess the sky's the limit we'll see yeah where the next five years take us and i've been really surprised also how i just assume everyone's been here it just like especially the, when there's a tour from Buffalo. If that was true, I'd be driving a much yeah, nicer right. car. <laughs> that is true. So, well, you know, the, 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 our normal tours also stop at, at Resurgence and Lafayette and uh, one or two other places. And you, I show of hands, how many people have been to Flying Bison? And mm-hmm. two people raise their hands out of the 14 on the bus. And I'm just like, really? And it's just <laughs> astounding to me that this is the first time they're going. Um, which is which is great because that's what I, w- I want it to be a good experience yep. and and I'm I'm sure with with the bus and everything it will be whereas yep. if you know you just sometimes you walk in to something and you're not prepared and you're just like I'm not going back there I don't know what the heck was going on. there's people running around everywhere right. and at least they're prepped for what's going to happen and right. I, I'm amazed how many people just haven't been out in these breweries especially the ones that we've gotten on the bus locally. Yeah. Nice. But the other brilliant thing about the way Bill runs his business is he actually makes reservations. <laughs> <laughs> so, so many Who would have people. Thought? People like knowing when you're coming. Yeah, exactly. exactly. And they can be ready. Yeah. Well, as we wind this thing down, uh, Tim, is there anything, a story we missed, or anything maybe we should have asked oh, that God, you can think of? Oh, God, there's millions of them. I know, we might have to do a part 18 two. years of stories. I know. Yeah. Um, wow, there's, uh, there's so many. I mean, just... Building here in what's called Larkinville was a pretty cool experience. Certain amount of frustration, certain amount of um, uh, joy at seeing something new literally come up out of the ground. The building we're sitting in is a barn. Uh, There was an old concrete block building on the site. And this is, and I I thought so much of, uh, of Bill's dad while we were doing this. When I was going to, uh, once you decide, all right, we've got to knock this building down. We, we really wanted to save it. We just wanted to be those people, the, the adaptive reuse of an old building. I think that's a great story. I think we should try and do that where possible. Uh, but <laughs> the concrete had heaved nine inches in one of the corners. You just can't do anything about no. that. You know, at some point it's got to go. So we had to go before... Uh, uh, Buffalo Historic Preservation Board and there's all these stories about Tim Thielman and oh, he's an obstructionist and he's all that kind of stuff he's the reason we have canal side he's the reason we have pedal boat spikes tiki bars floating around the river he's the reason he said we're keeping this we're, we're investing in our heritage we're doing this even if it kills you all <laughs> so he, he really you know he's he's a hero of mine he's and so he's on the board and our uh architectural firm we were dealing with and our building firm that we were dealing with and they work as a pair um so that's why we're working with them so we um go into the hearings oh and and they're getting uptight i said don't worry about it let me deal with this just just shut up just please just don't speak. Please trust me. Let me deal with this. And they said, well, you know, but I said, if it fails, you still got your checks. That's you right. Yeah. So, That's right. So we went in there. Mr. Chamlin recused himself because we had met each other personally. I had done benefits for the Historic Preservation Society. And he said, um, I, I shouldn't speak because I know Mr. Herzog personally, and I know, but I know where his heart is. I know he wants this to be the best possible city 
it could possibly be. That's really what he's about. It's really that simple with him. So uh, I got up in front and I said, we want to take this building down. And one of the other board members goes, oh, God, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, when we're all done, 45 seconds. I was on and off in 45 seconds because what we were going to put in place of that old building with the nine inch heaved concrete is this building. It's gonna look nicer, it's gonna be more functional, the utilities are gonna meet the uh, city regs. We had to put in a giant stormwater retention system that's gonna take some stress off of the city's st stormwater sewer, which doesn't really exist. Um, so th they were grateful and the guy goes, that thing was built in 46. It is, if you'll pardon the expression, but ugly. <laughs> and we don't need any more of those buildings. There's plenty of those in Buffalo. We just don't need any more. So we're all set. So that was easy, you know? And people get all cranked up and they have preconceived notions about certain things. Um, and going through it the second time was easier than the first time. We had a different administration at City Hall that and they had this thing, and I know some people are gonna hate it. It's called city stat. It makes people responsible, not just for what they do, but for what they don't do in a given day. And by the time I went through it the second time, it was like, we're in and out of there in hours, as opposed to years. Yeah. So that was, things can get better, and they have. Mm -hmm. Well, again, if you haven't been down here, come check it out next time you're in Buffalo, or if you live here, and Tim, can you remind people where can they find out more about Flying Bison online so they can maybe see some pictures of the place and uh, yeah. plan their next visit? Yeah, flyingbisonbrewing.com. Uh, follow us on Facebook. Uh, we're on Instagram. We do uh, lots of uh, unusual events down here. We have a That's really, true. really traditional Oktoberfest coming up, fourteenth. Uh, Friday, fifteenth, fifteenth, Saturday, the fifteenth of October. Uh, or, I'm sorry, of September, uh, the night before, we have the Buffalo Niagara Brewers Association Gala here on the same site. Um, other breweries from around town will have their beers here. Other brewers will be here. And our staff is going to pour the samples for you so you can just talk to the brewers. You can get a lot of, a lot of face time with uh, brewers. If we're not your favorite brewer, I'll go home and cry. But if you're not, <laughs> you're going to see your favorite brewer here and have a good time with them that night. And then traditional Oktoberfest the next afternoon. Well, that's great. This episode is going to drop right before all those events. And, uh, you know, I'm sure we'll be down here. You'll yeah, be down I here for go, sure. I, I was going to ask him about the gala because this is our first gala with the bus. Yeah. So oh, I'd like that's the, great. Uh, can, can you give me a ride? I can give you a ride. <laughs> I can totally give you a ride. Rides home for everybody. <laughs> Bill knows where I live. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, all right. Well, we're going to wrap this thing up. Tim, thanks so much for doing the show. Really oh, appreciate it. My yeah, pleasure. So much. It's good to just have a beer and hang with you guys for a bit. Cheers. Cool. Cheers. Cheers. Tim Herzog. Yep. We forgot to, I told you on the way down, they have the... Spot coffee in bottles, six packs are only $12, and I forgot to buy some. Yeah. Well, you had one. That was the beer you were sipping mm -hmm. on. That is. We did not, we did we not did. take any take-home beers. It's okay. But if uh, your listeners, if you're available or in town, or you just come in even after you listen to this, go check out the brewery, because um, mm -hmm. there's all those events happening this week, early September, uh, for beer week. Beer week. And uh, it really is such a comfortable place to be. It really is yeah. one of my favorites now, and uh, I can't wait to go back there. It sounds like you're going to be back there for uh, Brew Bus Buffalo. Brew Bus Buffalo stops there almost every tour. It is uh, one of the places to go, mostly because of it's big. It holds everybody. The beer's always good. They have a patio. They have they seat us in the brewery once in a while. Mm -hmm. They take good care of us, so yeah. we always try to go there. Yeah, well, it was a blast talking with him, and that was one of our longest ones ever. Yeah. I mean, he, he sounds like we, like I said, we might have to do a part two because he really did have some more stories. When we uh, stopped You just recording. want more beer. <laughs> well, the beer was nice. <laughs> but it's funny. I always like to bring you behind the scenes. When we stopped recording, he immediately said, oh, I forgot to tell you about this yeah, one rugby story. Yeah, just kept story. going. <laughs> and then we just kept going. For, we probably stayed another hour, hour and a half mm -hmm. there before we packed things up. So a really good time. Thank you, Tim. And uh, thanks for listening. 
you know, like I said uh, in the intro, we've uh, we've been gone for a little bit, but we're back now, and uh, we got some really good, really good episodes planned. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, reminder you, if you know anybody fascinating or has a fascinating story like Tim, then send it our way on our website, guystellingstories.com. We got a brand new suggest a story form. Sweet. And we're looking for people who have uh, interesting stories to tell from all walks of life, and we love it when people send us suggestions. So check it out online. And if you're new to the show, be sure to tap subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And we'll be back in just a couple of weeks with you, a brand new episode. Where do you get your podcasts? I use uh, Apple Podcasts oh, exclusively. Okay. <laughs> How about you? You got, I, I, you got the Droid phone. I go to so. our Facebook page and just go and download from there. Yeah, you know, and if you got any comments, if you like the show, send it to us on Facebook. That's the best mm-hmm. place for us to start a little conversation. So, all right, we'll be back, like I said, in just a couple of weeks. And as always, I'm Rich Douglas. I'm Bill Easton. Till next time. Thank you.